Uh, my name is Grant Ingersoll. I'm the CTO and co-founder of LucidWorks. I've been a long time uh, Lucene and Solar committer. I also uh, started the Apache Mahout machine learning project. So uh, I've been doing open source and building open source businesses for uh, quite some time now. What I wanted to talk about today is thinking about search and things like solar and Lucene in the context of a lot of the big data workflows that uh, many of you are, are likely familiar with, maybe expose you to some ideas and ways that you might use search that you hadn't thought about using search. And so I think a lot of the genesis of this talk comes from the fact that over probably the, fa the past five years or so, the capabilities in search engines like technology, like Lucene, like Solar, et cetera, have greatly expanded from doing just pure keyword matches, go find me this keyword in some document and return back to me 10 blue links. And so what I wanna explore in this talk is how you can start to think about some common problems that you might have and how search engine technology, in particular solar, might help you solve that. So if you're a, a Hortonworks or MapR customer, Cardera customer, all of those guys ship solar as the default search technology in it. So chances are, if you have one of those distributions, you already have solar at your disposal, but maybe you haven't been exposed to the concepts of what a search engine does. And so I wanna kinda of highlight some of those things for you, as well as talk about some of the changes and, and ideas that we've put into search in order to make this stuff more effective in a big data environment. And I'll particularly do that in the context of several real world use cases that we at LucidWorks have had. So at the end of the day, when I think about the evolution of search, I think one of the key things I want you to take away is that a search engine is really good at returning back a ranked set of results. Now again, you might think, oh, well, that's all about documents and quote unquote unstructured content. But I think as you'll see here, it really has evolved to take advantage of things like spatial information, enumerated types, uh, num numeric data, so on and so forth. And you can mash all of these things together and ask interesting questions of that data in ways that you can't with SQL or you can't with other tools or you can't as effectively with other tools. And so think of it, uh, search and solar as yet another uh, quiver in your, or another arrow in your quiver, if you will, to allow you to access and gain insight into your data. So with that, if you haven't heard of solar, uh, it's pretty much everywhere. It's an Apache software foundation project. It's maintained and uh, curated by a large number of companies across the continent. Lots and lots of downloads. Chances are you actually used solar today and you didn't even know it. Uh, it's been around since uh, 2006. Lucene, at its core, has been around since roughly 1997. You probably have all heard the Lucene story, of, you know, built by Doug Cutting way back in in the day. Actually, his very first Java program. Solar then, you know, provides a layer on top of Lucene. Essentially, takes all the things that are Java coding tasks in Lucene and either makes some configuration or convention, as well as provides a whole host of other things like distributed capabilities, sharding, failover, fault tolerance, all of that kind of stuff. Some of the key features, again, you know, you probably think of search, the very first thing you think about is full text retrieval. Yes, search still does that, it's still very good at that, it's very fast. But as you can see, there's a whole host of other things that come in when you start to look at dealing with different types of data. So things like faceting, being able to say, this particular set of results has these attributes. I want to know how many, when somebody searches for the word TV, I want to know how many Sony TVs there are, or how many Samsung TVs. You can slice and dice your data in lots of different ways very, very quickly and, and, and actually do things much more efficiently in some cases than you could out of SQL or other types of approaches. Uh, we support lots and lots of data types. We have things like autocomplete type of head search. We have spell checking, we have hit highlighting. So you can see where and why your matches happen in your data. Uh, but more importantly, you can actually bring in lots of different scoring factors into your calculations such that Lucene is able to surface uh, results across a wide variety of things. For instance, we have customers that take into account Obviously, whether keywords and text matches, the user location, the user's personal preferences, what other people in their network or in the, in the environment around them have leverage, all of these things then contribute to the weights that are returned as part of the scoring function and then give you the, your back your set of results. 
very difficult things, I think, to do in other engines, or at least to do them efficiently. You can see there's a whole bunch of other stuff. In some ways, when you think about it, what we're all after here, or what all of these data platforms are after is giving users different uh, tools to get at what is the core essence of this data. And I think you, when, once you get through this, you'll see that search is yet another way of doing that. So how does all of this relate to Hadoop? What I'm going to kind of do is walk through some of the basics, some of the things we've added both into the community and then uh, what we've done in open source on GitHub and Deliver as a project <coughs> at Lucidworks, and then talk about how some of this stuff all gets leveraged. Uh, so it turns out how many people actually know that Hadoop and MapReduce and HDFS actually started as part of Lucene? So a handful of you, yep. So uh, Doug Cutting and Mike Caffarella actually were building the Nutch Crawler, which is part of the Lucene project, and they read this fantastic paper from Google that said, hey, let's go do this distributed file system. Let's go build this distributed compu computation engine, all with the express purpose of building large-scale distributed indexes across lots of nodes, because when you want to crawl the web, you need to do that in a parallel uh, way. And so one of the first use cases then was to go and do this uh, in Hadoop and in HDFS. And then in fact, obviously Yahoo came along and spun out Hadoop and this is the whole reason why we are all here yet. But so at the end of the day, you know, what's kind of cool is what, it old, what is old is new again, except for we've made it a lot better and, and a lot more inherent to what we're trying to tackle. And the fact is, is you can take and very quickly and easily index all of your content in HDFS and actually store the indexes in HDFS. You can load them, shard them, all of that kind of stuff straight out of HDFS. And in fact, it's a perfectly valid way to go out and build search on top of your data lake, et cetera. And in fact, I often think a data lake without search is actually just a garbage dump when you think about it. Because if you're just putting everything in there and you have no clue what's in there, what good is that? So put search on top of your data lake. You'll thank me later. Other kinds of things that are going on at the basic level, obviously there's been a lot of push around security in Hadoop and all of the Hadoop related technologies. We've been working with our partners quite a bit to add security capabilities into uh, core solar and into, uh, into our products. We've also done a lot in terms of making sure that we play nicely in the deployment environment that Hadoop uh, and the Hadoop partners uh, bring to the table. So things like Yarn and Ambari and uh, Docker and Mesos and all of these kind of container systems, making sure that it's really easy to set up and deploy large scale distributed uh, search capabilities on top of all that. Some of this stuff is a work in progress coming soon, very, very soon. Uh, others already are in place and you can go try out and work with it today. Some of the things we specifically ship and, and provide to our partners around Hadoop, these are all uh, stuff that we offer up on our website, freely downloadable, all that kind of stuff. A lot of what we look at Hadoop, or at least HDFS for, is how can we get the data in HDFS and make it searchable? So we provide a whole bunch of capabilities around ingesting a wide variety of file formats, whether that's you know, your traditional office documents like PDF, Word, et cetera, all the way up through you know, your large-scale binary files, your sequence files, all of that kind of stuff. We've done work to integrate so that you can do two-way support with Hive, so you can actually treat solar as an external table in Hive, or you can actually uh, send your content from Hive into solar if you want essentially a secondary index on your content, or you want to match against that content in non-traditional ways. What do I mean by non-traditional? You know, things besides key value or basic joins. If you want to do fuzzy matching, if you want to take advantage of all of those core search engine stuff. A little bit less in vogue these days, but some people still use it. Pig, load store functions, all that kind of stuff. So if you're using Pig, you can integrate with all of this too. Uh, go to that URL, and I'll talk on Spark here in a little bit, uh, in a bit more depth, because uh, a lot of cool things where we can actually leverage Spark and that distributed computation capabilities to do a lot of these offline tasks that make search a lot more interesting because you can start to feed in all of these other elements of what matters in your content other than the actual content itself. That is things like how do users interact with this content? How do other systems interact with that content? And so you, can, you can see some really interesting ways to build out things like recommendation engines and stuff like that. So let's start with use case number one. 
Uh, this is one of our customers doing compliance checks. Basically, they want to make sure this is a large uh, service provider for doing a lots and lots of transaction data. They want to make sure that all their transactions are working properly. This is essentially a log analysis or a log search problem. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Splunk, maybe some of you with Elk and Elastic. These are you know, kind of the same thing, core bread and butter, taking all of your logs, go and make all of them searchable and, and be able to access that data in real time, get alerts, uh, get feedback on what's going on. Uh, in this particular case, this customer, uh, pretty limited uh, POC that we started off with, something like 14 billion documents, indexed them in, in less than a day, made all of them searchable. Whereas in their previous log analytics solution, they only really had a few days worth of data. They're now able to index all of their content and make all of it searchable so they can see the historical patterns that are evolving. Uh, with this, they also want to do things like keep this data around for at least uh, six months, you know, and growing to something like four billion log messages a day. So as you can imagine, this gets quite large and they want to be able to slice and dice and facet that data in lots of interesting ways. I'm putting up the use cases first and then we'll talk about some of the architecture here in a second. Another very, uh, oh, different update slides. I gave them an update, but they're not here. Uh, so what does this look like? Uh, we've kind of set up, uh, I've got a couple of sample architecture slides here and then I'll talk about the second use case which is very similar to this one. Uh, what we've done here is there's kind of two sides of this equation. What does the indexing side of it look like? I, how do I get the log data in? And then how do I get, uh, how do I actually query that data? So in this particular case, uh, what we've done is actually converted Logstash. If you're not familiar with Logstash, it's a it's a nice logging uh, framework from uh, Elastic. We've taken and converted that to work with Solar. You can go and download that from our uh, website. That allows us to get the log data in. We then take and, uh, let's see, I can point here, I guess, maybe not. Uh, we take and write that data into uh, transient collection. What we do actually is on the right side of the equation, we have uh, lots and lots of high, uh, lots and lots of numbers of shards for doing writing. And that's what that transient collection is. I think it's about two hours worth of data. And so that allows us to scale the writes very effectively. And then as that transient collection ages out, we actually merge it back into uh, a warmer or a, a larger archive on the back end, which can then be searched separately. So this allows us to do very effectively high volume writes while also continuing to serve very high volume queries because this, this query engine capability is actually something they give out to all of their customers as well. It's not just for internal IT operations, right? So you have to be able to maintain very high write throughput and very high read throughput. So that's what that transient collection is doing there. All of this stuff is provided underneath the hood by Solar and a little bit of cron task to just say, hey, go do these merges, go move this data around all of that kind of stuff. And then you can see here over time, basically what you have is shards or indexes, logical indexes per day. And of course, depending on your uh, requirements around keeping your data, you can then just slough off the old data as you see fit. If you only want six months worth, then only keep six months worth. What does the query side of this look like? The other thing that we've done is uh, we took the Kibana piece of, uh, of the Elk stack and actually converted that to work with solar. Works quite nicely. We get pretty dashboards. Uh, we've actually expanded it quite a bit as well, added a number of new modules, et cetera, that fit more with some of the goals that we have with solar. And then what you can see is you're just setting up querying those different aliases or querying those different uh, dates of the logs. And so now you have search across all of your shards. You can keep all the data. You have real-time access to it, all of that kind of good stuff. And with all of that, you have the nice backing of, of solar, which of course is, is uh, very rock solid, been proven, time tested, all of that kind of stuff, scales very well. And we'll get into some of the scaling aspects of it here in a minute. One of the other web cases, actually I had uh, uh, updated my slides, but not showing up here. This is uh, the other logging analytics problem that goes with this one. Although this is a large scale uh, web provider, uh, internet provider, you all know them. They're actually here at this conference. What they're interested in is doing actually web analytics on this log data, finding out what's trending, finding out who's doing what, when, and where, and then making decisions about what content they want to serve and all of that kind of stuff. The interesting thing here with this particular log analytics is just the sheer scale of it. 
the architecture actually ends up looking the same uh, with the exception that they're originally putting all of their data in Hive and then using our Hive ingest to, to set up and query against the search system. The other actually interesting thing here is they're using Tableau as a front end. Tableau has traditionally been, you know, towards JDBC or ODBC type database connections. Again, since search isn't a SQL engine, you have to then go and, and put some shims in to make sure Tableau uh, can do that. But it turns out to be a pretty interesting process uh, and that should be available pretty soon. Like I said, though, the real, uh, the real interesting kicker here is uh, we're talking something like 150 billion log messages a week uh, stored for six months as well. All searchable, uh, all in, and I think we'll be able to achieve sub-second search and faceting across all of that data. Obviously, a lot of hardware involved in that particular situation. The third use case, and actually I've put some links up to some other people who have give t given talks on this. This is a, a, a pretty large, well-known brand in the US worldwide that you guys all, in fact, probably own one of their devices or, or something along those lines. They provide uh, consumer-based cloud storage, so you can upload your pictures, your music, your PDFs, your, your keynote files, all of that kind of stuff. And they wanted to add search to that equation Obviously, at the scale that they're talking about, it gets quite interesting. There's actually a number of uh, interesting questions besides just the sheer volume of the data in this particular case, because essentially it's setting up and supporting a multi-tenanted environment. And so what they do is they have all their users' data comes in into Hadoop. They use Hadoop to you know, parallel distributed build these shards and build these indexes. And then they have Solar then serve all of them up. One of the key questions you face or challenges you face in this particular type of situation is you have to make sure that every user's data is siloed. You know, you wouldn't be particularly happy if your pictures were available to him if you didn't know who he was, right? Yet at the same time, like I can't afford to have him be in his own cluster with his own machines and all of that all of the time. In some cases, I may want to do that. For really large customers who perhaps have terabytes or petabytes of data, I want them to be on their own uh, cluster and have their own hardware and not be affected by anybody else. But I also have a whole bunch of small and medium-sized users who I have to take care of. And so I have to do a lot of work to be able to migrate people through that life cycle, bring them up to higher levels, and then bring them down and try to do that all seamlessly without going down and obviously without keeping your developers up all night or your DevOps team up all night trying to service all of this stuff. I would really encourage you to go read uh, or go watch the YouTube there from a, a woman named Jessica Mallett who explains all of this at our uh, conference at uh, Lucene Revolution that we had back in uh, November of the past year in the United States. There's also a really good talk that goes into more details by uh, Shalin, Shalin Mangar, who uh, works for me, unfortunately couldn't be here, uh, gets into a lot of the really nitty gritty details of what we changed in solar. Uh, with that though, I'll talk about some of the key solar improvements that we did working with this company and then donating back to the open source. A uh, number of things. Perhaps you, you know, you've heard about solar. You know solar actually leverages ZooKeeper for doing a lot of its distributed work. While this adds yet another thing you have to maintain, it does bring a number of benefits in terms of stability and avoiding things like split brain and, and other network partitions and kind of bad things that happen uh, almost always in the middle of the night when you would rather be sleeping than taking care of your uh, uh, software. So we've made a number of improvements to to uh, think about how can we improve interactions with ZooKeeper when we have lots and lots of collections. And by collections, I mean you know uh, uh, some subsection of the data that covers one or more users all put into one particular piece. So I have to be able to monitor and or watch all of those collections and make sure that any time a node failure happens, we can deal effectively and efficiently with that and then you know, move the workload or move uh, the data to somewhere else. So all of those are kind of, I'm uh, uh, waving my hands at a, a number of things that went on underneath the hood in ZooKeeper or in how we use ZooKeeper to do that. The second one I think is really interesting, this notion of deep paging. Remember at the beginning of the talk, I said we're really good at doing ranking and providing kind of top 10, top 20 results. That's traditionally been what search is really good at. 
but has always also been one of its downfalls when you want to go through lots and lots of results in a cursor like way much like you're used to doing in a database uh, this uh, graph here on the right is actually showing us paging through the results before we changed deep uh, before we added this cursor like functionality and then after we added this cursor like functionality so hint hint the green line is a lot better a lot more stable basically you can page through hundreds if not thousands of pages of results much like a database and have consistent performance consistent memory usage all of that kind of stuff this actually used to be really really bad in actually core leucine itself and then obviously also in the wrappers that go on top of leucine so lots of really nice improvements there other things that we've done uh, basically, one of the cool things about solar is you can pretty arbitrarily just move, uh, you know, split up your shards and move them around and change them. You don't have to, uh, we take a shard splitting approach to moving data around as opposed to a micro sharding approach where once you run out of the ability to move micro shards, you have to go re-index all your content. What we do instead is allow you to split the shards and move, you know, those sub subsections of the data around as you see fit. And this gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of how we add or take away hardware in our system. Last but not least, obviously with a client like this, we've got to do a bunch of testing. I'll talk about some cool things that come out of that that you can take advantage. And then finally, as I mentioned, we've got to be able to move those users around more easily. So there's nice commands that can basically say, hey, I want to move this user uh, offline, you know, offline. I want to move them to their own hardware. I want to uh, promote somebody in the small uh, cluster state up to a medium-sized cluster, all of that kind of stuff. And in fact, if you go watch that YouTube again, they even talk about how, Jessica talks about how they go about doing this as well and how they automate a lot of it and take care of uh, all of these things pretty easily. So what does this look like? Obviously, uh, you can offline, when I share the slide, you can read the fine print on it. The key takeaways here, what we've done is set up, this is all up on GitHub. Uh, I've got that down in the bottom. You can go to GitHub, download or clone this uh, particular project. And what it allows you to do is say at a push of a button, I want 100 nodes of solar. I want them all to be monitored. I want all of their logs to be collected. I want all of those logs to be visualized. If I want, it allows me to set up arbitrary architectures depending on what your sharding goals are, et cetera. Uh, right now, it supports doing this on your local machine for testing your, you know, your development purposes. And then right now with Amazon as well, but we're uh, moving to, uh, I forget, J Clouds, I think, so that you'll be able to support lots of other you know, infrastructure as a service kinds of situation. The key things to take away here, upper left corner, the support services. This is kind of all the stuff that goes into firing up the, uh, the cluster. So this is like Python scripts. We use Fabric. Uh, that was our developer's uh, re uh, uh, deployment system of choice. We use Bodo. We use a lot of automation scripts, et cetera. We use Kafka. We use Logstash, uh, various other monitoring tools for looking at what's going in across this cluster. Because one of the key things we had to be able to do is as we're simulating node failures, be able to identify very quickly where and why that node failure happened. Well, that's a search problem in itself, as I just mentioned with all the log analytics stuff. So why not eat our own dog food, put all of our logs back into search as well. Uh, so that's kind of the testing infrastructure side of that. We just use JMeter for load. Obviously, you would have your client application code here interacting with that stuff. And then uh, down here, uh, again, I updated these slides. They're a little bit off here, but the uh, Zookeeper, we've got Zookeeper involved. We take care of firing that all up for you so you don't have to. Uh, and then, of course, you have a whole bunch of solar cloud nodes there as well. And you, like I said, you can set up any arbitrary sharded architecture that you want. So in fact, what we would do is we would simulate thousands of these small collections we would simulate these medium-sized collections and then these large collections, and then we would simulate moving back and forth between them, having nodes go up and down and all of that kind of stuff. And the testing framework or that, that deployment framework makes all of that quite easy. The last use case is really starting to think about what I let off this talk with, about thinking how can I leverage this search technology and the underlying math that it does to my advantage to provide things like people who bought this also bought that recommendations. People who read this 
also read that. People who clicked on this also clicked on that. And in fact, this, if, if you've been paying attention for the last few years, there's a number of people out there who actually are using search engine technology to provide recommendations. And they're doing this at very large scale. There's a number of really large music services that do this. There's a no large number of social networks that are doing this uh, in terms of uh, identifying people who you might want to connect with all of that kind of stuff. What we were doing in this particular case is working with a very large US news publisher around how can we increase engagement on their content by leveraging, uh, in this case, our particular product called LucidWorks Fusion, which uh, Fusion basically sits on top of solar. And one of the things that it does with solar is provide a recommendation engine built in solar. So in fact, what you can do is take all of these logs that are telling you how users are interacting with your content, feed that back into search and into solar, and then really ask more interesting questions of it. What people, when they search for this, clicked on what documents, and then get back those weights and use those as part of your core query. So now what you have is a multifaceted recommendation engine when you think about it, right? I've got Lucene for a good core keyword matching, right? Because I can come in and say, find me all the things that say the word TV. I bring in this signals capability, this recommendation capability. Now I can add weights onto that query that say, not only match on the keywords in the context, but match on what other people care about, right? So do the collaborative filtering style of boosting. And then of course, if you want, you can layer on things like Solar has a really good spatial engine, so you can bring in location, you can bring in their past history, you can bring in their profile information, mash all of that up into a single ranking, and now you've got search results that come back out and are much better off than they would be had you just done text matching. This is what you know, we're all used to from Google, from Bing, from all of the, the big guys in terms of search. What we're trying to do is bring that to other people and bring it into the enterprise. Uh, in this particular case, some of the interesting challenges uh, around this data, you know, the size is pretty decent, three to four billion events per month. The really interesting thing is the half-life of this data of what is interesting from a recommendation standpoint is quite short, right? Because the news cycle is, you know, essentially drops off. It's hot today and, you know, by tomorrow, who cares, right? By the end of the week, nobody cares. Except for one of the things they want to do as a publisher is bring up related, deeper content, offline analysis, kind of the, the true journalistic side of things where it may take somebody six months to investigate something that's breaking. They have a really challenging problem of how do you deal with very short news cycles while still trying to monetize all of that historical content you have. And so that ranking problem is actually quite difficult. And I think one of the ways you do that is you look at how are users interacting with your content. One of the ways that we do this actually, and I mentioned earlier we we're gonna get to Spark, We've been doing a lot of work with Spark. This actually fits into Fusion and it also fits into those using solar. Uh, in our next release, which is coming up in about two weeks, we will actually be shipping Spark as a standalone service within solar or within Fusion. It has a solar RDD, so it's able to take data in and out of Spark and work directly with it. This allows us to take all of that signal data, all of those clicks, all of those purchases, all of that kind of stuff, store them in solar, which has the really nice advantage of it, makes it all searchable, and then use Spark to do these large scale offline aggregations to calculate our machine learning models, to calculate our ranking weights, all of that kind of stuff, and then feed it right back into solar. So again, when it comes to query time, we can say, hey, give me the aggregates, give me the weights for the signal data such that I can use it how I see fit in the rest of the engine. So we've seen a lot of good speed ups in here. The other cool thing that that brings us is all of the libraries that are available for Spark, things like GraphX, things like uh, if, you're not, if you haven't followed the latest in Mahout around what it's been doing on Spark or some of the deep learning libraries that work on Spark, all of those things are now available to us and obviously available to you so you can take advantage of it. We also have open sourced the core solar part of this, the thing that works with solar. Uh, so you can go and get that as well. 
we think this is going to be a, uh, give us a lot of capabilities in, in terms of processing a large volume of this signal data and getting at what we care at in that data. What does all of this look like? Uh, architecturally, one of our goals when thinking about building fusion was kind of, we had three things. One, we wanted to make sure we captured the signals and made, made, it, made signals uh, accessible to people who perhaps don't think about them. They don't think about how to capture user feedback. They need an easier way to capture user feedback than going and writing all of their models, all of that kind of stuff. The second thing we wanted to do is just build off of what we know to be a tried and tested solar architecture at scale. And so we leverage solar in many ways that perhaps you wouldn't think about. We store our machine learning models in there as a key value store. We provide blob storage. We uh, uh, keep all of our signals in there. We keep all of our users' historical data in there. We keep all of our logs in there. We keep all of our metrics around what's happening in the system there all in separate collections. You can move them around and maintain and shard them as you see fit. But the really nice thing is essentially it's, you know, it's like sp having Splunk right built into your core search engine. The really cool thing about doing that is you already know how to deploy solar. And you already know how to ask questions of solar. So in fact, if you don't like our math or our approach, you can go and just do a query against solar and do it yourself, right? And so what this then looks like is all of our services, the things that do NLP, the things that do ETL and pipelines, and the things that uh, calculate recommendations or store blobs, they just leverage the exact same infrastructure that solar does. And this makes for a hugely simplified operational footprint. You no longer have to maintain all of these different systems. You can just go and deploy more solar and it takes care of all of that. You can scale it in the ways you already know how to do, so on and so forth. Uh, and we can, of course, with all of the HDFS integrations, we can leverage HDFS and Spark where we see fit as well. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Hopefully some food for thought in terms of how to leverage search and leverage solar and perhaps ways that you hadn't thought about before. Uh, I hope you will take that away and go back and think about where and how can I leverage search to make my life better, to make my life more accessible or my data more accessible or in ways that perhaps you hadn't thought about. Uh, some of the roadmap items across uh, solar that are coming along, I mentioned the security stuff, lots and lots of performance improvements. I have a whole team that obviously all they do is work on performance. So we continue to see with every release, this stuff get faster and faster. Some of the other things that are kind of interesting at a higher level, being able to do joins across collections and then leverage those joins in the rankings. So this is really important for us, for instance, when it comes to these signals. A lot of the signals that we capture are tied to specific queries. So they're, they're uh, uh, not independent of the query. And so those are pretty straightforward for us to calculate weights and bring in. But there's also a whole class of signals that are document only. And so you want to be able to calculate those weights and uh, efficiently attach them to the document themselves. As it turns out, though, the way search engine technology works, doing uh, update to content is not an e uh, easy thing always. It works cleanly in Lucene and Solar and we handle the use case, but it's not always as efficient because we actually have to do a, a delete and then an add, right? And we do that very fast, but there's some cases where it's still not fast enough. This ability to do cross core joins and use those values, those query independent signals. So for instance, I can calculate page rank offline, store that in one core, do a cross-core join with it to my documents and have better scoring features. So that's being added. There's a whole bunch of stuff coming in around facets and analytics. We've been adding those for the past couple of years and continue to just invest quite a bit along those lines as well. So lots of interesting things going on. Uh, obviously not, you know, just scratching the surface in terms of what all they are. Uh, for instance, we just shipped uh, Solar 5.1 yesterday. Uh, which is the latest and has a number of these improvements in them already and a number of other things. So I would encourage you to go check out Solar. It's an Apache project, Apache licensed, uh, easy to get up and running these days, easy to scale out, all of that kind of stuff. With that, uh, it looks like we've got about five minutes for questions. Uh, there's my contact info if you'd like. Any questions?
the question was what about failure tolerance at scale? Yep. Uh, actually, it, it works quite well there. This is one of the benefits we get of Zookeeper. We've done a lot of uh, testing with uh, Jepson. If you've heard of Jepson, it essentially simulates a lot of network partitions. Uh, if you just go search for Call Me Maybe Solar, uh, it'll come up and show you what we've done along those lines. Actually, it's, it's quite robust. One of the things actually we pride ourselves on is making sure we don't have data loss and then making sure that we have accuracy in our counts and in our data. Uh, a lot of that comes from the approach we take in how we do our sharding, how we do our things like leader election, how we move data around, all of that kind of stuff. So obviously, you know, some of the companies I'm talking about here, this is powering, you know, world-class services used around the world, and they rely on the fact that we've done a lot of this work to make sure it's very fault tolerant. Yep. Uh, can you elaborate more on the Spark SQL? Uh, uh, Spark SQL maybe, and maybe on the Spark work, and how it's not just the Hadoop, uh, no Hadoop uh, API, right? It's more deeper than that, right? So, and, and I'm not the developer who wrote all of it, but so I don't know exactly all the details, but we started off with the solar RDD, which allows you to get data in and out, and then we've got, basically when we do our signal aggregations, or we do like building up recommendation models, et cetera, we, we're leveraging the Spark APIs to go through and do do those aggregations, do the math on the data to come up with the, you know, come up with the model, come up with the aggregate. The other nice thing, of course, is anything that runs on Spark, you can take and drop that in. One of the things that we have in our system also is a scheduler and all that, so you can schedule these jobs, you can have them occur, you know, just have it run Spark jobs as you see fit, so on and so forth there. Right, so the question was is how are we interacting with Lucene and Solar at a low level in Spark? We're not actually copying all of the data off. This is where a lot of that deep paging stuff comes in of being able to effectively iterate through the data. Sometimes you do have to move it around. Uh, sometimes what we try to do is take advantage of doing the computation in, in Lucene or Solar itself. I don't know the full details on the implementation. I would encourage you to go check out the source code there. But I, I think, you know, uh, you know, obviously this is our first, you know, official draft, re you know, release of it, so I'm sure there's lots of improvements to be had. Um, I've often thought, you know, like having, and, and there are some projects that do this. We do ship like native input formats for Hadoop, for instance, for Lucene indexes. But because there's different data structures in there, you have to, uh, you know, provide different ways of looking at that data. Sometimes you want to get at what's called the stored data side of Lucene. Sometimes you want to get at the terms dictionary. Sometimes you want to get at the posting list. So taking advantage and doing, knowing which one to do is often left to the user to say, I want to do this part of the data. Because uh, remember, we're building an inverted index here. So yeah, no, good, good question though. No, like I said, I don't know all the details there. Yep. Any other questions? Got two minutes left. All right, well, fantastic. I thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of the uh, summit and uh, feel free to contact me offline.